Have you heard this saying before, healthy things grow? Now, granted, it sounds a little cliched, but for the most part, it's true, right? If we're talking about businesses, all but the smallest grow and evolve over time. Well, that's true for nonprofits, too. It may be changes in the business environment, regulatory change, or simply changes in what consumers want or need. But what happens when an existing nonprofit is looking at something much bigger than just an evolution, more like a complete change of purpose and mission? That's what I want to talk about today, so let's dig in. Hi, I'm Greg McRae, founder and CEO of Foundation Group, and welcome to our 501c3 University channel, where we break down nonprofit compliance and make it understandable. Changing purpose and mission. Now, organically driven change, it's normal. In fact, it would be strange if a nonprofit didn't evolve with the times. But it's something else altogether if a board is asking whether or not to change the organization's original mission. Can it even be done? And if so, how? Well, the short answer is yes, it can. And the how depends a lot on the degree of change. So let's take a look at a few scenarios. The first example is an expansion of program scope. Scope creep in general, it's pretty normal, and it's usually a gradual increase in reach of service. Maybe you're adding new service areas or new beneficiaries, but your core focus isn't really changing. This is the most organic version of change, and it may look something like this. Youth Voices is a community-based children's performance choir that targets elementary-aged kids in economically disadvantaged neighborhoods. Their current reach spans a three-county area, and after several years of operation, the nonprofit's activities, they've grown in popularity, and the executive director has been approached by another county school board to see if Young Voices could expand to include their district. This is textbook organic expansion. It's still within the original purpose that the IRS approved the organization to conduct. Expanding Youth Voices to reach other counties or even other parts of the country would not require the organization to seek IRS approval of the expansion. Even if their original 501c3 application stated a three-county approach, they're not locked into that. That's just what was known at the time they applied. So example one, good to go. Scenario two involves adding new programs. Now this can be as organic as the one we just talked about. Over time, situations change and healthy organizations adapt. That evolution and adaptation can include new programs added to the original. So let's look in on Youth Voices seven years down the road. They are now serving a 10 county region and what was once six elementary schools is now 14 elementaries and four middle schools. Plans are in the works to add two high schools next year. But here comes a new idea. In working with children these past seven years, the executive director and the board have continually seen that the majority of kids in the program are behind in grade level reading. Now the board chair proposed in a recent meeting that Young Voices explore the possibility of adding a tutoring program to their existing operations. So if they do this, how does that impact their 501c3 status? Can they just add tutoring programs without seeking IRS approval? Well, the most likely answer is yes, and here's why. When the IRS grants 501c3 status, it does so based on the fact that the nonprofit's activities satisfies one or more charitable purposes. Now, here's where you have to know what qualifies as charitable and in what category. Activities targeting children are broadly considered educational if they're designed to expand a child's knowledge or life experience. So we're talking schools, daycares, arts groups, sports. It's a broad range. In this situation, Youth Voices is considered an educational charity. The original program of Music for Kids is C3 qualifying as educational activity, and tutoring is also an educational program, so expanding to include that new program is squarely within the bounds of their 501c3 determination as an educational nonprofit. So example number two, good to go. So what happens if you're looking to replace one program with another? A great example of this is the well-known charity March of Dimes. March of Dimes was originally founded by President Franklin D. Roosevelt in 1938. Known then as the National Foundation for Infantile Paralysis, the nonprofit was formed to fight the scourge of polio. The foundation was a major funder of Jonas Salk, who developed the polio vaccine, effectively eliminating the disease from the U.S. The March of Dimes still exists today, doesn't it? After the eradication of polio, March of Dimes changed their purpose from a focus on polio to improving the health of mothers and babies, primarily focusing on infant mortality. But the mission still involves kids and health. So, 
Even though a lot changed, a lot stayed the same. Going back to our Youth Voices example, what would happen if all the schools served by the nonprofit started their own choral programs and cut ties with Youth Voices? Could they simply do what March of Dimes did and replace choral programs with the tutoring programs? That answer is yes, they can. Example number three, good to go for a third time. So, we saved the head scratchiest for last. What about a complete change of mission? Completely changing your mission isn't organic and it isn't evolutionary. The reasons for the change may have been a long time coming, but the decision to change is going to be abrupt. And if that includes going from one purpose category to another, it's probably going to be pretty disruptive too. So how drastic are we talking? Let's use an extreme example to illustrate. It might not be realistic, but it gets the point across. Youth Voices has now been in operation for 10 years. They had an amazing run for the first seven years or so, but the program has been in decline for the past three. More and more of their partner schools, well, they've started their own music programs, and now what was once 18 participating schools is back down to four. And even in those, it just really seems like the program has run its course. The board decides it's either time to wind it all down or find another way to positively impact the community. Now they have discovered that the city-run animal shelters in their multi-county area are all overwhelmed and simply don't have the resources they need. The board sees this as an opportunity to remain viable and changes its name from Youth Voices to Second Chances Animal Services. The new program includes plans for building an animal shelter to help with the overflow affecting the county facilities. Seriously, can they do that? I mean, isn't the IRS going to come after them? Well, happily, the answer is most likely, yet again, yes, they can do that, and no, the IRS isn't going to come after them. Now, Young Voices, now Second Chances, will have to report this quite sizable change to the IRS on their next Form 990 filing. They'll also most likely need to amend their name with the state. But as long as they continue to function in an exclusively charitable manner, they do not need special permission from anyone other than those legally permitted to vote on such matters, namely the board and or the membership, to approve what they're planning to do. We can't wrap up this conversation without first addressing some exceptions. First, if a 501c3 is switching from being a public charity to a private foundation, it's really simple. Just start filing Form 990PF and voila, you will be accommodated. But if you're going from a private foundation to a public charity, well, then it's a much harder process and will take you five years to complete it. Yep, I said five years. We'll talk about that more in another video. Another exception is pretty rare, but it happens, and we've worked with dozens of them. This is where a 501c something wants to become a 501c something else, like a 501c3 that wants to convert to a 501c4. Now, the IRS really doesn't have a set conversion path for this, though we've managed to pull it off a few times. In most instances, it's actually a lot easier to form a new organization and transition activity from one to the other. Now, that doesn't always work, though, especially if it's a 501c3 converting due to their assets being dedicated to a charitable purpose. There's a lot to that, and we'll save that for another video. But that's it for now. Help us out and hit the like button. Subscribe if you haven't already. We've got loads of great content and more on the way. Thanks for watching. Go serve your community.